Welcome back, fellow mitochondriacs, for another episode of Cancer as a Mitochondrial Metabolic Disease. Today, we are going to continue our discussion of cancer-related cachexia, and this will be the final video on cancer-related cachexia, and although we will discuss one additional mechanism as to how cancer-related cachexia starts and is made worse, we will wrap this topic up today talking about some practical possible therapies in order to break the variety of vicious cycles that are at play here. So without further ado, let's get into it. So we are in the middle of the total discussion when talking about lactate and lactate dehydrogenase. And we took a detour when we started talking about how lactate relates to cancer-related cachexia. And I think that in the prior video, we hit the connection between lactic acid, lactate, and cancer-related cachexia pretty hard. And you may believe that's where the story ends in terms of a mechanistic of how mitochondrial dysfunction function, cytosolic in the case of lactate and mitochondrial in the terms of succinate level phosphorylation. But what we did not talk about was the other aspect of substrate level phosphorylation, which can lead to cancer-related cachexia. So again, in the last video, we discussed how glucose is fermented to lactate, and then the lactic acid or the lactate is what's responsible for not only the extracellular acidification as delineated by this graphic here, but how lactate effectively leads to excess body weight loss for cancer patients and how potentially certain types of exercise can diminish this process, whether by just frankly stealing glucose away from the tumor and the tumor microenvironment or by creating some kind of a lactate gradient, which was hypothesized by this group here. But today we're going to talk about the other aspect of substrate low phosphorylation, and that would be mitochondrial substrate low phosphorylation in terms of the fermentation of glutamine into succinic acid or succinate, which again also acidifies the extracellular environment, but also has signaling roles above and beyond that, which relate to this process of cachexia. So for the first paper, I'm going to pull up this article that was published in July of 2023. It's titled Extracellular succinate, a physiologic messenger, and a pathological trigger. And it says here, by contrast, environmental toxins and injurious agents induce cellular secretion of succinate to damage tissues, trigger inflammation, and induce tissue fibrosis. Extracellular succinate induces cellular changes and tissue adaptation or damage by ligating cell service succinate receptor 1 and activating downstream signaling pathways and transcriptional programs. And you can see here that succinate is being transported outside the cell, similar to that of lactate, and it's going to have signal that goes on both inside cancer cells and outside cancer cells. And what I wanted to show today was how succinate can lead to muscle tissue remodeling as well as excess thermogenesis. And what the article is basically saying, succinate can be a normal physiologic messenger under certain conditions like exercise or cold exposure, which is how that leads to changes in muscle cells and thermogenesis or the loss of weight. But when we have excess succinate that is kind of consistent constitutively activated and present in super physiologic amounts that can damage muscle cells and their ability to regenerate. And so this paper was published in July of 2020 and is titled The Wasting Associated Metabolite Succinate Disrupts Myogenesis and Impairs Skeletal Muscle Regeneration. And basically what it says at the end is that this study broadens the repertoire of wasting associated factors that can directly modulate muscle progenitor cell function and strengthens the hypothesis that metabolic derangements are significant contributors to impaired muscle regeneration, an important aspect of cancer-associated muscle wasting or cachexia. And again, we're talking about how instead of glucose and lactate being responsible for the muscle wasting process, we're talking about how glutamine also contributes to this problem through the fermentation or the mitochondrial substrate level phosphorylation and leading to excess amounts of succinate or succinic acid that is produced having these metabolic effects. I hope that this is showing that not only does the metabolic approach to cancer treatment make sense not only for the tumor itself, but it also makes sense for breaking the variety of vicious cycles that are happening and are as a result of the cancer effectively stealing resources sources away from the body to make itself grow out of control, such as cancer-related cachexia. So how do we look at potentially approaching this, knowing what we know about cancer as a mitochondrial metabolic disease, knowing what we know about the kind of drivers of what leads to cancer-related cachexia at a metabolic level? What kind of levers can we pull to have an effect here? So although it is potentially somewhat paradoxical in nature because ketogenic diets in a lot of areas of health 
and medicine are used to help lose weight, the ketogenic diet as the foundation of metabolic therapy, which helps us cut off the pathological substrates such as lactate and succinate that leads to the cachexia downstream. So this paper was published in September of 2021 and is titled Ketogenic Diets and Pancreatic Cancer and Associated Cachexia, Cellular Mechanisms and Clinical Perspectives. And it says numerous studies report that a ketogenic diet reduces tumor growth and can act as an adjuvant therapy in various cancers, including pancreatic cancer. However, research on the effect of the mechanisms of action of ketogenic diets on PDAC associated cachexia is limited. In this narrative review, we summarize the evidence of the impact of ketogenic diets on PDAC treatment and cachexia mitigation. Furthermore, we discuss key cellular mechanisms that explain ketogenic diets, potential antitumor and anticachexia effects, focusing primarily on the reprogramming of cellular metabolism, epigenome, and the gut microbiome. So this paper had fantastic graphics that help illustrate our points. So I'm going to read some of the graphic associated texts. So it says in A, cancer cells undergo ver various metabolic modifications to satisfy their energy needs. High levels of insulin and insulin-like growth factors can induce upregulation of insulin and insulin-like growth factor dependent PI3K, AKT, mTOR system and RAS, RAF, mitogen associated protein kinase, ERK, kinase, MEK, ERK cascade. KRAS mutation affects glucose dependence dependency. The express, the expression of glucose transporter one is stimulated, increasing glucose transport, glucose uptake, and glycolysis. Pyruvate kinase isoform M2 and lactate dehydrogenase are overexpressed, so lactate levels increase. Hyperglycemia inhibits AMP kinase, which in turn activates mTOR. What we have here is we have hyperinsulinemia and hyperglycemia, which lead to all the things that are wrong with cancer-related metabolism. And we've gone into great detail about that. And even a lot of the metabolic and genetic signaling that is going on that upregulates those things. But what a ketogenic diet effectively does is it reverses that process. And it says ketogenic diets reduce circulating glucose, which halts glycolysis, decrease blood glucose, insulin, and IGF-1 levels inhibit the PI3K, AKT, mTOR pathway, and lactate production. Therefore, selective starvation in cancer cells and targeting proliferation and survival. Ketosis activates AMPK, which inhibits mTOR. Mitochondrial dysfunction and lack of mitochondrial enzymes that metabolize ketone bodies cause the mitochondria to decrease ATP production. And so what this is basically showing is how a ketogenic diet is going to shut down at least one of the vicious cycles here, which is some of the signaling cascades, and then the availability of glucose to the system, which is going to limit the availability of lactate that's being secreted or fermented by these cancer cells. And then because the mitochondrial dysfunction that's happening in these cancer cells, as well as the lack of enzymes to metabolize them, then you're going to basically selectively starve out the cancer cells and you're going to nourish the cells that have intact mitochondria and normal oxfos. This is something that this is not a surprising revelation within our community because this is what we talk about over and over again with the mechanism of how a therapeutic ketogenic diet functionally works. But what we're seeing here is that it's directly having an effect on the signaling cascades and on the lactate production, which is going to lower the amount of lactate that's secreted and it's going to lead to decreases in the lactate associated cachexia. Then it has a nice graphic where we have the cell metabolism, we have the microbiome, and we have epigenetic changes. And it says here that major proposed mechanisms of the beneficial role of ketogenic diet and PDAC, the cell metabolism, epigenome, and gut microbiome have a complex interplay in pancreatic ductal adenocarcinoma, PDAC, and associated cachexia. PDAC cells depend on glycolysis and lack enzymes that allow them to use ketone bodies as fuel. On the other hand, skeletal muscle has mitochondrial enzymes D, beta-hydroxybutyrate, dehydrogenase, BDH1, succinyl-CoA, 3-oxoacid-CoA transferase OXCT1, and acetyl-CoA transferase ACAT1, which allows ketone body utilization. The regulation of gene expression in cachexic skeletal muscle can be controlled by epigenetic mechanisms through acetylation and deacetylation of histones. The balance between histone transferases, HATs, and histone deacetylases, HDACs, is perturbed in muscle wasting. A ketogenic diet could modulate the gene regulation of pancreatic tumors and skeletal muscle by affecting their epigenetic state. HDAC inhibition by ketone bodies, the actual ketones themselves, could have an anacatabolic effect. Finally, the gut microbiome is, is altered in PDAC and cachexia, influencing PDAC progression and potentially cancer cachexia. The ketogenic diet can shift the microbiota profile and have a, a role in regulating tumor growth and cancer cachexia. It then talks about the clinical perspectives and future directions. 
Although ketogenic diets are an established therapy for epilepsy in humans, the evidence for a clinical beneficial effect of ketogenic diets for cancer patients is less consistent, but nonetheless promising. Ketogenic diets seem to be most beneficial when used as an adjunctive therapy with other treatment strategies. Even though many studies included only a small number of participating patients, they have provided promising indications that a ketogenic diet is safe, feasible, and improves outcomes in patients with several types of advanced cancer. Regarding its effect on mitigating cancer cachexia, a majority of the studies indicated that a ketogenic diet preserves muscle mass, suggesting that it might prove to be instrumental in limiting cancer cachexia development. Unfortunately, the current state of evidence in clinically relevant PDAC models and or human trials is limited, and further work is required to elicitate applicability of a ketogenic diet in PDAC cachectic patients. Given that the evidence suggests that the effect of the diet increases with time, investigations at an earlier stage in disease progressions are warranted to evaluate long-term effects of ketogenic diet in mitigating PDAC-related cachexia. What we are doing with a ketogenic diet is we are limiting the amount of glucose available to the cancer cell. And so therefore, a ketogenic diet is one way that we would be breaking the vicious cycle of glucose being converted to pyruvate, pyruvate being converted to lactate. If there's no glucose available, then there would be no lactate that would be made or less lactate to be made if less glucose is available. And then lactate, of course, is being transported back to the liver to be converted back to glucose and then providing glucose to the cancer cell through gluconeogenesis. So we are, with a ketogenic diet, basically trying to break this, this vicious cycle right here. Now, that begs the question, if you were to then block the metabolism of glucose or the metabolism of lactate, would that effectively do the same thing? Well, that led me to find this paper that was published in September of 2022, and it's titled 2-deoxyglucose alleviates cancer cachexia induced muscle wasting by enhancing ketone metabolism and inhibiting the quarry cycle. It says 2DG effectively prevents muscle wasting by increasing ATP synthesis efficiency via the ketone metabolic pathway and blocking the abnormal quarry cycle. And it has a nice graphic that's associated with it. So basically what glute is doing is instead of being on a ketogenic diet and limiting glucose availability for this to happen, what they're doing is they're using 2DG, which is a hexokinase inhibitor to effectively block this process from happening at the level of glycolysis itself. And it's having an effect at preventing this Cori cycle, vicious cycle, which is leading to cancer-related cachexia. And what it says here is that cancer cachexia results from an imbalance between energy supply and energy expenditure. Apart from the decreased energy supply caused by anorexia, several types of futile cycles, such as the Cori cycle, cause a higher energy expenditure. Even in the presence of oxygen, the energy generated by oxidative phosphorylation in mitochondria is insufficient for most cancer cells. Thus, the energy generated by aerobic glycolysis or the Warburg effect or substrate level phosphorylation is increased to compensate, which is less which is less effective for energy generation. Since most cancer cells have an increased demand for glucose to compensate for the supplementation of glucose and reduced plasma level of lactate, increased hepatic glucose production by gluconeogenesis is commonly observed in cancer cachexia. In our study, we observed that cachectic myotubules secreted more lactate than the healthy control myotubules. There was increased transcriptional expression of glucose phosphorylation enzyme hexokinase, the key enzyme for the first and rate limiting step of the glycolytic pathway, which regulated glucose metabolism and accompanied by decreased acetyl-CoA and ATP generation, indicating that aerobic glycolysis rather than oxidative phosphorylation is a major glucose utilization pattern in cachectic skeletal muscle. These results indicated that cachectic myotubules exhibit a similar metabolic pattern to that of cancer cells known as the Warburg effect under aerobic conditions, which produces lactate. Lactate produced by the tumor cells and cachectic muscles are transported to the liver and converted to glucose via the Cori cycle. Since the liver requires energy to carry out gluconeogenesis, the aerobic glycolysis is an energy inefficient process. The overwhelming activation of the Cori cycle, therefore a futile cycle and energy wasting process. In addition to altered glucose utilization and increased aerobic glycolysis, cancer patients have been shown to have glucose intolerance and elevated production of hepatic glucose. Increased hepatic glucose production may be stimulated by an increased glucose requirement, which might explain why, apart from the increased energy expenditure, elevated plasma glucose triggered insulin resistance and excess are also common pathologic features in cancer cachexia. Additionally, the enhanced generation of lactate by aerobic glycolysis has been found to be linked to cancer metastases and recurrence. Again, what this paper is trying to say is that if you block this vicious cycle in the muscle and in the tumor itself, you're going to decrease the amount of lactate that's produced. The muscles 
can be reprogrammed back to ketone metabolism easily because they have intact mitochondria, whereas the cancer cells can't. So the muscle cells will then kind of go back to their normal functioning. And so breaking this vicious cycle is critical for the muscle itself. And so they're proposing to use TDG. But then I got to thinking, I'm like, well, don't we think that if a ketogenic diet does this and 2DG does this, that probably other either drugs or supplements would do this. And so I started doing some literature searches based on that premise. And what was I able to find? So I was able to find papers like this that were published in 2020 and 2022, respectively, titled Flavonoids, Nutraceutical Potential for Counteracting Muscle Atrophy, Role for Plant-Derived Antioxidants in Attenuating Cancer Cachexia. Later, Quercetin Supplementation Attenuates the Progression of Cancer Cachexia in These Mice. Quercetin Improves Muscle Mass and Mitochondrial Content in Murine model of cancer and chemotherapy-induced cachexia. EGCG effectively attenuates skeletal muscle atrophy caused by cancer cachexia. EGCG protects against fat and muscle atrophy in melanoma-bearing mice on a high-fat diet. Efficacy of curcumin on treating cancer anorexia cachexia syndrome in local and advanced head and neck cancer. A double-blind placebo-controlled randomized phase two study evaluating the effects of curcumin for treatment of cancer anorexia cachexia syndrome in solid cancer patients. Berberine improves cancer derives myocardial impairment in experimental cachexia models by targeting high mobility group box one resistance training and resveratrol supplementation improves cancer cachexia tumor volume in muscle tissue and male mice bearing colon cancer cell tumors psilibenin mediated metabolic reprogramming attenuates pancreatic cancer induced cachexia and tumor growth and so on and so forth and that includes metformin and vitamin d etc. And the reason why is because we have talked about these substances over and over and over again in a variety of enzyme systems or whether we're talking about glycolysis and cytosolic substrate level phosphorylation or even mitochondrial substrate level phosphorylation when we're talking about the metabolism and fermentation of glutamine. And the reason is because these systems are working on the hallmarks of cancer at the level of metabolism. And so, of course, you're going to see these other beneficial effects of these substances apart from just tumor growth themselves, right? You're going to see how when we shut down the pathologic lactate and succinate production by exercise, by a ketogenic diet, by 2DG and subsequently multiple other flavonoids and drugs such as metformin, then it would make sense that it would have an effect not only on the tumor itself, which we talked about over and over again through a variety of mechanisms, but it would also have effects at protecting and kind of reprogramming muscle cells to prevent and mitigate cancer-related cachexia. So we have now, at this point, covered cancer-related cachexia at a very high level. It was definitely a lot deeper of a level than I was planning on going when I first saw this graphic when I was doing research on lactate and how it relates to cancer-related cachexia, which led me to 2DG and led me down this entire and led me down this entire kind of rabbit hole. But I do think that I personally have a better understanding about how cancer-related cachexia is set up and propagated and how metabolic therapy, ketogenic metabolic therapy, with the foundation of that being a, a therapeutic ketogenic diet, as well as the utilization of certain drugs and nutraceuticals, and not any less important, but the therapeutic use of exercise to shut down cancer metabolism, but also to break the variety of vicious cycles that are seen within cancer-related cachexia. If you like videos like this, please like, share, and subscribe. And until next time.